Mm. Hello, uh, welcome to another uh, Closure Weekly Study Group. My name is John Stevenson. Thank you very much for joining me. I hope you're going to enjoy this. So uh, this week I'm going to look at uh, building a, a website for uh, this virtual study group. Um, I've got a simple website, but it's it's just static, uh, static uh, Markdown's uh, website, uh, which is okay. But um, I'm going to try and start building something a bit more dynamic, um, something that will kind of help give a nice overview to all the different episodes <clears throat> and something you can kind of search through as well to find the, uh, an episode quite quickly. So basically trying to uh, give a, a slightly nicer interface than just using the uh, the YouTube playlist. Um, <clears throat> so only, I've only just made a start on this. So we're just doing the basics of just getting uh, a website up and running. Uh, we're also going to deploy it onto GitHub pages. So we've got something live uh, for free uh, without uh, any, any kind of um, we, are, we, we don't have to uh, kind of invest in servers or Docker or anything like that. We can just simply deploy <coughs> deploy the website as uh, HTML and uh, JavaScript onto GitHub pages and serve it that way. So, uh, and if we get a chance to, we also have a quick look at um, some React Native. Um, I've had to double, I play with that about a year ago with JavaScript, uh, but uh, it'd be nice. You can also do that with Closure Scripts. So you can actually build a mobile app uh, for Android or iOS and uh, in Closure Script and use React Native to just deploy it just like a, a normal website. And some nice tools, there's a tool called Expo, which can, does help with that. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how easy it is to, to do that with Closure Script. So I'm going to share my screen. And there we go. Share we. So, <clears throat> where are we? Uh, okay. Um, so we've got the virtual study group here um, in uh, in the sort of practically closure uh, book and writing. And um, all I've done with here is just create a, a little logo so you can click on the broadcasts, a description of the broadcast in general terms, and then some other useful links as well. <clears throat> this is okay, it's it's easy to um, easy to work with and easy for anybody else to update. It's just HTML, it's just markdown rendered into HTML. But then that does kind of lead to some limitations. <clears throat> um, I could embed some of the uh, uh, some, some of the videos in here as well. Uh, that would be fairly straightforward. But I wanted to be able to try and this is a very static uh, web page where you can't you can't click on anything except to view the recorded broadcasts. You can't kind of search through this either, except just doing a control find. find. Um, <clears throat> so it'd be nice to, as we get more and more episodes, it'd be nice to kind of be able to just help people just find the episode that they're looking for. Um, so I, I've had a start with this. Um, I've got a little bit further than what's actually published. So what I've got at the moment is just this <clears throat> a fairly simple bootstrappy closure script react website <clears throat> and um so the idea the, the first idea i had was just to have these uh, cards each card's going to represent a broadcast and it's got a button where you can go in and click and uh, play the broadcast and it'll take you off to uh, youtube and uh, start playing the, the video um we can also take this so that uh, if eventually we just have the video playing there or you click on this uh, card and it expands into like the whole page uh, and then you can see more details and actually even then play play the video as an embedded video rather than going off to uh, to the YouTube uh, website. But we're going to talk through how we kind of built this and um, uh, yeah, so it's a fairly simple closed script reagent project with a bit of bootstrap and using uh, sort of like the, the classic lining and project as well. Um, if we uh, so let's just touch on what reagent is. So closure script, uh, if you're if you're not familiar with that, closure script is just closure, uh, but instead of running on the Java virtual machine, uh, which is where closure started, um, so closure script will basically generate JavaScript for you, <clears throat> and we'll see this from from our project. Good morning, sir. Oh, hello. Uh, it's Manny. How are you doing? Good, good. How are you doing? I am excellent, thank you very much. So I'm just explaining what we are actually doing today. Uh, you kicked off as well? Yes, yes. 
So we got <clears throat> so we're going to take uh, this virtual study group page here and build something in closure scripts reagents and, uh, and make something like this. Well, in fact, this is what something I've made in closure scripts and reagent in a bit of bootstrap. <clears throat> so if you haven't used uh, reagent before, then uh, there's a really nice guide here, and I'll put a link to this in the in the show notes um, on on reagents. So it's basically a wrapper around uh, React.js, which is the um, the relatively popular uh, way that uh, people in JavaScript world will build websites these days, single page apps. Um, so you have just one page, and it's a very dynamic page. You can interact with it. So it's like having a, it's like having a, a very fast like desktop app, but all within the the web page. And uh, the simplest approach you can do is, is actually just to write some HTML, uh, but rather than actually write HTML in HTML syntax, so instead of using this div div uh, for a for like a divider. You can just use a vector in Clojure, and um, and then the the tag name. So this div name is uh, is just a keyword in Clojure as well. So that just makes it a little bit simpler. So instead of writing this, you can write uh, this form as well. <clears throat> the advantage of doing this, as well as I think, it, I mean, my own personal view is it looks nicer when you do yeah, it. It's, it's much cleaner actually. Yeah, <clears throat> and you don't have to worry about closing tags as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's quite nice, and um, and also this is a data structure enclosure, so we can manipulate it as a data structure. Um, so we can run functions over this. We can interrogate this as a, we can get information from this data structure as well. It is just a vector. It's a vector with. Um, <clears throat> in this case, it's got key value pairs, but we're not really using it as uh, a map as such. But um, but yeah, because we don't need to have that extra. Complexity, and uh, we can just basically very easily define. <coughs> excuse me. We can simply easily define what our website should look like uh, using this structure, <coughs> and we can include. Uh, oh, excuse me. You're getting hiccups <coughs> because you're on the hiccup, you're on the hiccup page, isn't it? Yeah, I think I've got um, a post wind. Well, I've got winter flu now. I think. Mm. Well, your your URL <coughs> says reagent hiccup, so that's what's giving you hiccups. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, yes, that's better. Uh, yeah, so Hickam is the is the library <coughs> that converts. So basically, the library will convert uh, <coughs> um, this data structure. Uh, so if we look at uh, these two, so it will it will Hickam will take this data structure <coughs> and it will generate uh, the the relevant HTML for you. <coughs> So if you're actually not sure how to do something in Hiccup, you actually just look at the, the HTML. You can just do view source in your, uh, or inspect in your web browser, see what the HTML is, and then just write it in this form as well. As I was doing with some of the scalable vector graphics, because not all of that, there isn't, there's, there isn't really a kind of comprehensive Hiccup version of, um, of uh, it's like all the scalable vector graphics tags in closure closure or closure scripts. So, uh, but it's easy enough to read the um, it's easy enough to read <coughs> uh, the S the SVG specification that's all in HTML and just convert it into the hiccup as well. Uh, cool. And then you, you can include uh, closure in this as well. So this is a closure function. That we're including into that, so this is just generating um, some. Uh, yeah, so it's going to generate some content in that data structure for us, just programmatically, and um, uh, yeah, um, uh, we can also put in some style. So it's like style rather than using like the embedded style. We can we we put this in the style in as a map, as like a, as a map of options on the tag. So if you've got a divider, <coughs> we can uh, we can put some style on that by adding this map here, and um, <coughs> you can specify things like margins, width, color, uh, and so on, and that affects <coughs> everything within inside that tag. So this tag would be this text would be 
if we set the color for this text then that this then any text in with inside the div would be of that color or background or so on and so on <coughs> uh, you can do forms and other check boxes as well there's a lot of other stuff you can do so pretty much anything you can do in html you can you can represent in uh in, in this hiccup style language and so uh yeah so you can use this same style the same way of defining html code uh in with reagent as well it, that supports the hiccup style uh yeah i think that's all i'm going to cover there so i'll put the link into this into the show notes afterwards this reminds me of um <laughs> of jade have you heard of jade yeah yeah I mean, it is it is kind of like uh, it's nothing entirely new uh, because there's there's people been putting uh, stuff into uh, HTML, so dynamic code into HTML in here. The nice thing is it's 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 just closure. This we're not we're not having to write a separate language. You're not having to learn a separate language. It's just all uh, data structures and code. Anyway, so that that's I think that's the kind of slight. So conceptually, it's the same, but the actual implementation is, I think, is quite nice because it's it's straightforward. It is just closure. You're you're learning, so you don't have to learn anything else. So I think it does make it a little bit simpler. But once you've learned closure, obviously. So. <clears throat> but yeah, anything you can do with the DOM and stuff like that. But then like manipulating the DOM and things that we we kind of tend to leave towards uh, reagent as well. So it's it, it gives us a nice abstraction to to not have to kind of work with the the document object model in the browser directly. Hmm. Ooh, got some comments. Oh, we've got some links there. What's, the, what's those links you've been posting? Oh, there we go. They are the same links you've been uh, showing on the in the video. Okay. okay. Oh, there's Thank a link on Jade that I posted <clears throat> because I thought it was interesting. All right. Okay. Yep. Yep. Oh, thank you very much. I don't like the term, so. um, and so, and one of the other things I've used for this project is Bootstrap. Um, hopefully, most people are familiar with Bootstrap as well, but it, it's just this really nice uh, CSS and a lot of JavaScript um, uh, style uh, for websites. So, make your website look like it's at least had some kind of professional. Uh, thought going into it. Although uh, since Bootstrap came out, then a lot of websites look like they just like a Bootstrap, which which is good because I think a lot of boot websites were looked like they were built by developers uh, who, were, who were not familiar with uh, UX and UI. Uh, and with Bootstrap, you can kind of fake it until you actually do know a little bit more about it as well. So you can create a nice, a nice, nicer website. Um, uh, in that, so yeah, creating something like this was was fairly easy with uh, using Bootstrap to do that from scratch. I'd have to if I didn't know what I was doing. If I wasn't using Bootstrap, it would take me a lot longer to to build something like this. And there's lots of components uh, in there. So typically, I just I, I come and look for things in here. Also, I do a Google search for like the things I want to do, and it, it kind of tells me. Uh, how to how to write them in HTML, uh, and that's very easy for me to transfer that into um, uh, into Hiccup as well. And so the nice thing about this, it does show you what the cards look like. So I think, um, yeah, uh, yeah. So that's basically kind of the card I, I borrowed for um, for this. Um, and you put images on there as well. So it does show you what things look like. Oh yeah, that was the one I used, and I, I just basically translate this into uh, uh, Hiccup style. Um, so I'm going to walk through what we built. Um, let's see. Is there anything else I was going to cover? No, 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 no. Uh, I'm not going to touch on testing this time. There's an interesting, um, uh, there's an interesting uh, thing from Lambda Island about running and testing closure script tests, but I haven't actually done any tests for this yet. Uh, I shall uh, I shall endeavour to add tests uh, as soon as I can. Right, so this is what we're going to build. And so how are we going to do it? Um, so I've created a project already. Um, this is a project on GitHub. Uh, 
under um, properties. So there's a study group. So there's a study group website, which is the actual content I'm generating. So that's a project I'm writing. Uh, and then there's a closure study group, which is uh, a repository I'm using for deployment. So this is the, the actual project I've created. And um, I haven't actually set up it to be like a nice deployment platform uh, pipeline yet. So this is just a, a simple project. I'm just going to build it uh, and then manually copy the relevant files over to the other projects. Uh, and then I can I can just publish it. So this is a much simpler version of the, the output from the other uh, project. Um, not the most elegant way of doing it. There are better ways to do it, but uh, I haven't had a chance to set those up yet. So this is just basically pushing out the, the HTML page that we'll see from the project, uh, the compiled JavaScript, which is a single JavaScript file, and, uh, and some CSS, <clears throat> which... Um, I think I just added a little bit of style there for um, to over to complement one of the existing Bootstrap uh, um, styles already. So let's have a look. Right. Uh, yep. Yeah, so this is yes. Uh, and oh, I, I have wired this up to um, Circle CI, which is a, a um, continuous integration server that was actually written in Clojure and Clojure Script as well. Um, they're they are very good. They're a very good CI CD server, mm -hmm. I'd say. I recommend yeah. using them. Yeah, yeah, and obviously they support all languages, even even things that aren't Clojure and Clojure Script. And um, uh, this is a bit of a, a cheek because I don't have any tests, so it's always going to pass. So that's, uh, that's a bit naughty, but there we go. Uh, when I write some tests, I'll, I'll at least know if they're passing. Test-driven <laughs> website development. I'd like to see that. Um, I, I'd like to, yes, I'd like to do that. If I was uh, being a bit more professional, I would do that. Um, OK, so let's look at the code. Let's look at the code. So <clears throat> um, I'm, I've got the code. I've been, I've been experimenting quite a lot with this. It's a bit, so the final state of this is a bit messy. Uh, actually, that's why I've got uh, in the in the Closure Study web group uh, website, web, Closure Study Group website. I've got the master branch, but I've also got this uh, layout experiments, which is where all the, the really messy stuff I'm doing has become as, as I'm kind of experimenting with different types of layouts. Um, <clears throat> so if you see master, then it will give you kind of this view of the website. But we'll look at kind of uh, some of the other things I've been playing with uh, as, uh, as I get into the code as well. Um, uh, yeah, so I've been moving things around and changing things around and doing lots of other stuff as well. <coughs> but there's um, there's a really nice uh, tool in Space Max, and uh, hopefully this is in other editors as well. So if I do a Space uh, G for uh, the GitHub version control menu, there's something called uh, Time Machine Transient State. Uh, if I uh, so if I press T. I can go back in my history and go right back to the start so we can kind of walk through right from the start of the code and step by step go through uh, how, how I've actually created this so far. So that's what we're going to do in a minute. <coughs> Ooh, excuse me. And so this is showing me the, uh, the right at the bottom of the page. It's showing me like the commit um, titles as well. So if you use meaningful commits messages as well, this makes it even e it makes it makes it even nicer to use. So I just created this project with uh, lining in, and so I just did a, a line new uh, fig wheel project with uh, with uh, reagents as a, as an option as well. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, so we've got to look here. So uh, in the log history, you can see uh, I've just created uh, a line new fig wheel. Uh, oops, a uh, line new fig wheel uh, project. So it's using this fig wheel template. So it adds um, this. Uh, it adds fig wheel to the project. So I, when I'm making changes, it's going to show me exactly what's happening. Um, this is the name of the project, Closure Virtual Study Group. 
and then I'm just adding reagent as, a, as an option there. Uh, so it'll add reagent uh, libraries and a little bit of um, basic code to make reagent work as well. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, yeah. So it does a bunch of stuff to create, to help figure wheel starts, uh, adds a project file, oops. And it just basically adds a, a simple uh, bit of code to make everything work. So that's uh, oops, clear, that's quit tips, that's clear, that's there we go. Uh, ooh, cool, it's kept it. There. So what you get out of the box with this template is <clears throat> uh this enable console print allows you to get uh, messages in the uh, console in the web console so you can see uh, what's going on uh and it will um this will print out uh, uh like a message as a placeholder for your application if it if it's uh so you can see if it's actually loading in the the rendered javascript uh or if it's just so if you see this message then it, it hasn't actually loaded in your application um, We've got an atom which is going to hold our application state. So this atom is called app state. And um, <clears throat> so I'm going to add uh, like the details of the broadcasts into here as well, and also put in like some of the some of the text for the website as well, and anything I want to change dynamically, I'm going to end up putting into this map uh, as well. So <clears throat> at the moment, I've just hard coded kind of the information I want to see. Uh, eventually, we, I'll, I'll kind of write some hooks into the uh, the YouTube API and be able to just pull down the the list of uh, the broadcasts that I published and any broadcasts that are scheduled. So that way, I don't have to manually keep adding uh, like video content and descriptions to uh, uh, to this website. It will just automatically should just automatically pick it up. Um, that's assuming the um, the YouTube API is, it works nicely, which hopefully should do. Um, and this is just has a simple function called Hello World, which simply just gets the uh, gets the the value that uh, the text the text keyword points to in the map that is App State. So in App State, we've got text, so it's just basically going to get the value which is Hello World, and you're going to put that into um, uh, heading one. And uh, it's uh, it's also got like a fixed a hard coded um, heading three uh, with just a specific uh, bit of text in there as well. And then this is just rendered onto the web page by using this uh, render component. So in <clears throat> in Reagent, there's this idea of components. A component is simply well, it can be it can be a bit of text, but it's usually just a uh, a function call. Or the the value of the function call. Uh, so this hello world is uh, is the component that we're going to render, and you can have multiple components you're going to render. But typically, you would have one one main component that is your single page app, and then you would have sub components within that application as well. Um, and uh, uh, we'll show we'll see that at some point. Uh, there seems to be any questions so far, so let's keep on going. So, um, yes. Uh, John, I must say the layout branch that I've just um, pulled in yes. has got the same file. It's got slightly different content than that you have on your screen. It's possible you've cleaned it up and you're going to start from scratch, but it's got a lot of commented out code in here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So th this it can is be deleted, right? Or what is it? Well, what I'm showing you on the screen at the moment is the is the initial commit. So oh, the, that's right. Okay, I didn't navigate yeah. to that. Right, yeah, yeah, right. yeah, sorry. Sorry. yeah. So, uh, yeah, just to kind of walk through how, how I've evolved this code as well. Oh, okay. Start, uh, I think I switched the browser, so I didn't see you do that. Sorry. Okay, yeah. Uh, why are you running this? Let's see, let's see what happens. I can't remember if I was already. You did it through Time Machine, did you? Yes. Yeah. Let me try Time Machine. It asks me next, 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 previous. So I got to say previous, 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 yeah. previous. All the way to the first commit. That's right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That was four days ago. Yeah, I'm on the same page as you now. Woohoo. 
Woof. Uh, Finally. Yeah. And um, one of the other one of the functions I haven't mentioned yet is this on JS reload. Um, I haven't actually used this much myself, but if you wanted to inject some kind of app states updates, uh, if you wanted to basically change every time the page reloads, if you wanted to do something, uh, maybe you wanted to reset some kind of um, some part of the uh, app, st app state. Here, I think it's just uh, yeah, it's just doing a fig wheel counter, so it's just resetting the counter for some reason. So you might do something on a page that updates a counter, and then but if you reload the page, then you want that counter to start from zero again. So <clears throat> yeah, so you can do those kind of things in there, and it's kind of a way to I don't know, uh, yeah, a way to help you test um, what your application is doing, or to uh, yeah, uh, like walk through particular scenarios. Uh, of the application. Um, so I think that's running. Uh, so let's hope the, has that started on here? Uh, How did you run that? Did you do a command line <laughs> thing or did you run it from your Emacs? Um, I run it from Emacs um, and I'm not sure if it actually has started it or not. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure if I was still already running it, which might have been a problem. Um, Let's have a look. Let's go back to yeah. So I just did. Um, oh, did I do the even the right thing? I'm not sure I did the right thing. Let me see. Um, let's see. Uh, so uh, you actually, did cider. You did cider. Yeah, so I did cider. I can't remember if I did jack in or it should it should be able to do jack in uh, closure script. So you do the comma double quotes. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember what I pressed now. Uh, <laughs> oops. Let I me did. see what. Uh, let me see what. Hmm. Okay. It's, it little... did something. It's got. A, there's a buffer running now. Um, it should. It should ask you uh, to um, which like build tool uh, that um, you want to use. So um, that would be. Oh, it's just running. I'm not sure why it didn't ask me about fig wheel. Maybe it just guessed it. Oh, but I lost my time machine. Uh, oh, there we go. Let's go. It's not reading it off my time machine. Uh, yes, I, I'm i wondering whether, I oh, guess it's working. There we go. So you should get, uh, so if you open the closure script um, buffer, mm -hmm. um, so the CLJS one rather than the CLJ, then it should tell you uh, what the web pages you need to go to. So you need to go that to connect. Uh, but I think Time Machine is just showing you, is walking you through it. It's not actually changing the, un the underlying code. Mm. So you'd, you, if you wanted to, when you're running it, so I'm running actually uh, a new um, a new. You're version. running the latest commit. You're not running the first commit, right? Yeah, that yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. Which is probably why I'm getting an error. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it says now my thing is running. Uh, let's go. The REPL is on. Oh, no. The REPL is running, but not the website. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, I think there is a bug actually in the latest version. Uh, oh, okay. Bug. I didn't think there were bugs in closure. Okay. Oh, no, it works. No, well, there is when I write them. <laughs> oh, right. So you should, you, should, uh, you should ban you from doing any closure. Well, when I write them for uh, for fun, uh, there's, there's sometimes books, uh, especially if I don't do tests. Oh, actually, that's working. Not too bad. Uh, oh, wait, yeah, so it is working. Uh, I think there is a slight um, uh, bug with mine. So um, oh, that picked up. Yeah, what was it 3349? Uh, three four four nine. Three four four nine. Yeah. Yes. Did you have to say localhost or did you say zero point zero point zero point zero? That's a good question. Uh, what I I did do zero dot zero dot zero dot zero, but localhost should work as well. Exactly. Okay. Got, um, got that. Uh, so this is where I've got to so far. So it's actually using specific kind of uh, content in there as well um, for most of the things. I haven't uh, I've added. Um, number number ten yet, um, uh, but yeah, and I've lost. Uh, I haven't got the images sorted out yet, so uh, 
I've got some stuff that thing to uh, to fix yet. Let's walk through what we've got so far. Um, space speed. Um, so if I do get space speed T back to the time machine. So we've got this. So this is um, <clears throat> yeah, this is just printing out hello world essentially um, on the page and uh, and this sub subheading as well. And I just added a bit of uh, documentation as to what um, what I wanted to build, and what we were going to build out of there, and then some specific uh, components that we were going to add. So <clears throat> we'll work on kind of yeah. So the study group website. So that's what the, my, the, the main component I'm going to do, and then like a broadcast recording, like scheduled broadcasts. So that'll be uh, like an upcoming broadcast that I've scheduled. Uh, and then inside the broadcast recording, there'd be descriptions, a thumbnail, um, and uh, I'd want to kind of put that into some kind of ordered collection of uh, study sessions uh, later on to allow user interaction so you can control the order of that. So you might want to start from the beginning, so see the first one first, or you might want to start at the end and see the, the, the most current recorded session, um, and then like a full display of so that's kind of like my initial uh, minimal viable product, as it were. Um, and then let's go for the next one. So then I started building the, the study group um, components. And um, so I think I updated the model a little bit as well. Yeah, there we go. So in the in the app state, so this is my data model. It's my, like, basically my database that as all the content for the website. So I've just created a, a so I've taken the map and basically given this uh, as, as the website. Um, I guess that if there's non kind of specific websites that I can break it out. So I've, so I've got here the website and then I've got specifically the broadcasts. So this website section is is kind of the, the general kind of theme for the website and the description of the overall website. And this section, this key is going to describe all the broadcasts um, in there as well. Uh, so the website has a title and a description, copyright, and so on. So that all goes into. Uh, I could all be uh, attached as like basic HTML attributes to uh, the website, and so I start putting those in in as this uh, study group website here. So just created a div. Um, so whenever you have a function in uh, Reagents, um, you kind of need to uh, wrap it into uh, a single div if you've got multiple uh, things. So if we, we've got two distinct uh, structures here. So we've got a heading and a, a heading three, and those need to be wrapped inside a, a div. I couldn't just do them without the div um, because there'd be two things that would, and Reagent wouldn't know which one to draw it might just draw the first one so you you only want to give it a single structure or a single fu like function uh underneath the the this uh this function itself so so here we're wrapping everything in a div um yeah to make it uh, nice and simple uh and so this will just grab uh from the app state uh it'll traverse the app state and it'll go to website and then it'll pull out the title or the value that the title points to and the same thing with description as well. So it's a simple get in statement that just walks through uh, this app state and says, okay, there's a website, there's a title, uh, and there's a value uh, for title, and there's a value for description. It just pulls those out. So those, those evaluate into uh, to strings as well. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Another cat. Oh, cool cat. Uh, so if I evaluate the, just these H3s, you can kind of see what it's doing. So it's evaluating this kind of get in and replacing this get in uh, function with the actual string that uh, is in the app state itself. Um, so it's a, when you've got this attached to a REPL, then it's very easy to uh, just go in and see what, uh, what it's doing. Oops. Uh, 
Oh, oh, my code's going away. There we go. Oh, it's coming back again. That's what it gives you using uh, Git Time Machine, but it's quite handy uh, to navigate things. I think. Uh, we get to, oops, no, it's gone again. And so, yeah, so then I added this Jumbotron. Oh, actually, I'll tell you what. Hmm. I'm trying to get it to uh, zoom out and do the time machine. And it doesn't seem to want to do both. There we go. That's not very nice. Let's, let's try again. Actually, oh. oh, okay. Hopefully, you can still read this anyway. Yeah, so we've got uh, we've got a simple thing and put the title and description into something nice. We used uh, this jumbotron, which this is a class uh, this is a, a class style from Bootstrap. So let's go and look basically how we added Bootstrap. So I just did that in the index file. So if I open the space uh, project file uh, and we go and look at the index. Oops, index. Uh, it's in uh, resources public, and uh, we can uh, we see where we've edited this, edited this. So this HTML file is part of the template, and um, we have uh, yeah, it's pretty much there. So they've already added this uh, script tag in here which is the, the name that's set up in our project for our compiled JavaScript. So when we run our closure script, it's going to generate this closure script virtual study group file, which is a JavaScript file. And then it'll inject that into this div that's called app. Um, and that's where, that's where the render function in our code, in our closure script code, uh, looks for it looks for this div called app in the web page and then this gets inserted into this closure script stuff gets inserted in there as well um, and I've added uh, so that's already done for us and I've added uh, what have I done here I've added uh, oh yeah I did the fonts so I've used the Ubuntu style fonts here just for my content delivery network so I don't need to download these locally these, when you go to the, visit the website, then it will just use these fonts by downloading them as well. And it's pretty quick. It doesn't really add too much uh, load on like loading the web page as well. And I've done the same thing with Bootstrap as well. So if we go to the Bootstrap website, it just gives me this uh, text uh, to paste into HTML. And it's just basically pulling in Bootstrap libraries from its content delivery network. Uh, and this is a particular version it's pulling in, and it's all minified, so it's all nice and small and uh, tightly optimized as well. Um, and I think this is just a uh, char key, just to make sure that there's no kind of cross-site scripting kind of attacks on the actual content delivery network. And so all that is on, oops. That's a nice safety thing. Since when has this been introduced? Has it always been there, this integrity thing? Um, I'm not sure. I think it's been there for a little while, for the last mm -hmm. year or so. Um, yes, but I, I, I think the first time you used it, it wasn't there. I think in version three of Bootstrap, it wasn't there by default, but uh, version four, it's it's there. Mm. Make sure also it's the right uh, thing you're downloading, just in case the file itself is corrupt. You know, maybe it's not hacked or anything, but it's corrupt. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it gives you because I mean, with JavaScript, you could potentially do anything to mm. your, your website, and if you're using somebody's bad JavaScript, then it yeah, could do some bad things. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you go to if you go to the Bootstrap website and uh, you can just click on get get started, then it just like suggests it actually recommends this um, using this Bootstrap CDN as the, the main approach. So you can just you could just use the, uh, the CSS, just copy that in, uh, which is what I did so far. I haven't used any of the JavaScript stuff in there yet, uh, but there's there's a whole bunch of like uh, jQuery and simple kind of JavaScript features you might want to include as well. Um, 
and so it shows you, shows you how to include those uh, as well. And it also shows you how to do, like download the bundles uh, and have them locally. So if you wanted to, if you wanted to have a look at the code and see what it was doing, delve into the uh, things more specifically, especially if you're on offline, then you could download them and have a look at them as well. Uh, and so it shows you, um, yeah, it shows you how to actually put them all together into your HTML page as well. Um, yes, and I think there's anything else. Uh, yeah, and there's just some caveats about what what your HTML page should include. So it should include this doc type and, uh, and language definition and so on. Uh, but yeah, I all I have done is just simply copy the CSS file into the HTML page. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, let's look. So let's go back to uh, let's go back to the, the code. Uh, okay. There we go. So, uh, yeah, so I did the jumbotron, which it gives a grey. Um, uh, grayish kind of jumbotron version here. So, this, so it basically adds this. This green, big, big green square is what it's adding. Uh, except it's not green when uh, when you just use the jumbotron. It's a it's a very grey version of it. So I wanted to figure out how to change that at some point. Uh, so let's go back. Uh, next, did I do that next? Uh, uh, I think the next thing I did was I actually, uh, rather than using this, uh, I wanted to try and figure out how to uh, represent like the ordering of broadcasts. Um, I did uh, this this slight bug here. Um, I can't have a name that like starts with a number, so that doesn't work. So I couldn't just do broadcast like colon one. I could probably do that as a string. That that should work. Um, to kind of like keep consistent, I, I ended up changing this to um, to use this uh, kind of notation, which is uh, closure study group, and then zero zero one, and then I could then organize like sort this. Hopefully, sort this by orders using the uh, the numbers. Uh, so that was the the thinking. I haven't, I haven't tried that yet, but um, yeah, I, I might want to kind of order them. And an easy way to do that is if we know the ordering of each broadcast. So that's what I've added there. Uh, next, what did I do? Uh, oh yeah, so the next one was just to update the header, page header using Ubuntu fonts. We've already seen that. Uh, and so, and now I've started to refactor. So the the website title uh, is still there, but uh, so the, I, I've got, uh, I've taken that out and put it into its own function. So rather than having uh, this div, so basically I took this div that was in the study group and, and pulled it out as its own function. Uh, so this is a good way to kind of evolve the design. So you start off with one component and then as uh, as kind of sections of that component become more uh, complex, you break them out into their own function. Uh, and it also helps uh, you kind of treat each of those se sections as a, a dynamic component. Uh, so um, if if I change the website title, then just this component gets updated, and, and then just that bit of hit of, uh, of change gets pushed to the uh, to the website. So it keeps the the updates quite minimal. So if I change the app state somehow programmatically, then um, it would trigger uh, React to redraw this particular component. Uh, and, uh, and and display the new version of the title uh, and the description uh, if they changed. And so the way you do that is you use the same uh, syntax as you do for the render component. If we go to uh, the where render component is, so render component. I changed this. Yeah. So this is like the study group website uh, component that we're going to render. So that's our main component. Uh, and this is in square brackets, so we're not actually calling this. We're we're just basically uh, uh, putting this as a, a collection of components that Reagent is going to render for us. So re basically, Reagent is going to decide when we call these functions. 
And uh, so it, it typically does that based on uh, a change. If it sees a change in the state that that component uses, then it'll, it'll re-render it for us, it'll redraw it for us. Um, and so it's controlling when that function is actually called. And so rather than using, so normally we would kind of use the, um, oh, we're going to say, normally we would, we would use the, uh, like a function call in round brackets, but because we want to have reagent uh, control when this website title is called, then we put this in square brackets, and it's it's no longer a function call. It's a, it's a it's a bit of information for reagent to then decide. Well, if if there's a if there's a change in this, then this is a component that I'm going to manage uh, and and manage any state changes in there as well. So it's a very simple different syntax. But it, it kind of has a, a bigger application uh, change. How does that? How does that do that? Because it's considering this whole thing as a data structure, so it's like an element in the data structure, and then it's knowing it that way. Or does everything get inlined? Well, yeah. So, so this this uh, this is all read by reagent as well. So reagent's processing all this stuff. So it'll set up like a a model internally um, and um, how it actually does it I'd have to have a look at the reagent stuff specifically but uh, but this is basically uh, saying that uh, I want to attach this as a, a reagent component mm -hmm. rather than just uh, yet another function call in enclosure mm, okay so like the so like with this one here so this is a this is just a function call enclosure it's not managed by a reagent it, it's called whenever this function is called. Mm -hmm. But this website title is called by reagent itself, so it's kind of instrumenting uh, around these things when it sees mm, okay. uh, these square brackets. Oh, I see. Okay, it's yeah. probably keeping hooks around those things. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's some mechanism I haven't S delved see, into. Same with the broadcast card as well as one of those hooks, right? Yes, like exactly. Down below. Yes, exactly. I've done the same thing here as well. So rather than I could just call the function, uh, but because uh, broadcast states. Uh, which is uh, oops, where yeah, yeah, because broadcast state also has also pulls things in from the app state. Then I wanted to, that to be um, uh, a component that's managed by reagent as well. Or oh, is all of this happening lazily? Uh, in a sense, yes. So it's what well, you're you're offloading the um, the decision about when to call. Uh, these functions to uh, to reagent itself. Um, so, and reagent, yeah. So, yes. So it, it is in a sense kind of like not happening, not necessarily happening straight away. You're not saying, "Well, just call this function." You're saying, "Well, this is a function to to call when when some like, application state is changed." So, when you first run it, obviously the applicant you get a new application state in um, in here so it sees this so then all the components uh, that use that are going to get drawn for the first time uh, because they're all part of the they're either the study group website component or a sub component of these things so when you put something in square brackets you, you're turning it from a, a function call into a sub component of, of the uh, of the component that it's in Uh, yeah, so yeah, so I started to as so I, I I tend to kind of start building things in the single component, and then as it gets more, uh, as the code gets more, I start separating them out into their own functions because that way uh, it's easier to figure out what the functions are actually called because you've actually built the code around it. So here, this obviously was kind of just uh, building the the website title, so it was easy enough to oh I'll just call the function the website title then and make that component. And then same for broadcasts. Um, uh, I wanted a broadcast as a card, so that's what I did. I just created this uh, broadcast card function uh, and called it, uh, put it into the square brackets, so it would treat it as a React component. Uh, and here I've done. I've, I've got a div with some style. So again, these are Bootstrap styles. So this Bootstrap style is called card, uh, and I'm giving it a width and uh, we've got an image source as well, um, although this doesn't seem to be working. Uh, or it was working, but uh, I think I've broken it in 
oh no this is working but my later version is broken um and then within the so this is the overall card this is kind of the outline of the card with the uh where in, in the card we've got uh components we've got an image component we've got a body component here uh and then inside the body we've got the the title and um uh the card text as well so kind of the description of uh, the card in there as well and uh was added an anchor which is uh, of a class button so basically just added a button that's just when you press it it's a, it goes off to this link uh which is the um that's the broad this is the address of the broadcast on youtube <clears throat> So I don't think it's doing anything particularly different. Where yeah, we're just adding these class uh, styles to um, uh, to the divs, and uh, this is all again. I just got all this from uh, looking at Bootstrap, uh, going into components, uh, going into card, and uh, just saying okay, there's there's a card that's close enough, uh, and it basically just is this. Uh, but in in hiccup language as well um yeah i didn't i didn't change very little of that as well um yeah and this is giving me this pretty much gives me something like this i think yes i think that gives this version of the code there um so it's pretty easy to kind of build something that looks I don't know, like basically professional website or certainly better than most of the other websites I used to create before using Bootstrap. And um, yeah, uh, oops. and then so to actually get the grid layout, um, uh, where is it? There we go. Yeah. So again, I'm just I'm just using a, a Bootstrap class here uh, called Row. And so I'm using this as the, the fact that Bootstrap is a responsive design. So if we, if we kind of, so here we've got a full web page, but if we make this uh, smaller um, and smaller and smaller, then it should eventually kind of start to uh, move things onto a different, um, different scale. So it's got one row, but sometimes those rows will fit uh, up to four. Uh, but other times, then, if you're viewing this on the mobile device, you'll just get the row of, of one, and everything will be automatically done, uh, reshifted around so it fits better on the the smaller form factor. So a proper kind of response. So it's a very easy, simple way to get a responsive design for your for your website as well, uh, and just using the fact that somebody else has already figured out how to do it for you, uh, which is quite nice. So this is using the um, and the grid, I think it's the grid, uh, something like that. Uh, so these are using, so it's using a, a row, uh, and then within the row, we're saying how how big each card is within inside that row. So we've got <clears throat> each card is is taking up a column width of three, and so on a full website, you've got a column uh, of twelve. So you've got 12 columns on a full website. So I could have 12 cards. If I did this, just, just did this as column MD1, then I could have 12 up to 12, I'd have up to 12 cards when I maximize my web page. Um, although the cards would be quite uh, small, so it'd be harder to get some content in. So I've done number three, so we would get basically get four cards, because three goes into 12 uh, four times. And that's why we get the, the four cards. Uh, in each row here, even though logically in code wise, we've just specified this as a single row, we're getting bootstrap to kind of put them in groups of four uh, if there's big enough space. And if there's not, it will narrow them down uh, to fit on the, uh, the form factor of the display for us. That's all pretty straightforward once you get used to it, I think. Yes, there's a question. Um, you know the um, in the browser itself, there is a mode in which you can switch between all your screen view ports. I think you've got to be in the dev mode in the developers. Um, yeah, probably is. Yeah. And then you can see how the, the responsive design uh, is responding to it. Yeah. Um, 
Where is it? It's normally, yeah, it's on the top left corner. Uh, not top left corner of this developer panel. Left. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you click on that, yeah, there you are. Oh, yeah, and then yeah. on the top, you can see the responsive thing. If, yeah, oh, if, yeah, 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 yeah. Then, then you can change. You see, they have improved quite a bit. They oh, can change. The, if you do, click on the responsive, you can click and change to the different phone types. Oh, uh, they're the quite standard ones. So yeah, look how good or not so good. Yeah, I've noticed that um, because it's so the mid-size form factor is not great, so I'd probably mm. need to do something about that as well. Uh, it might be um, settings, kind of the media. Uh, so I think if you go to the if you go to the HTML page in this, uh, there we go. Um, yeah, so you can set things like viewports. Um, so I might need to experiment with that to get uh, yeah. different sizes. Or so it works. Because at the moment on the iPad, it's trying to do like a full web page. Mm -hmm. um, and when it probably, it, I would kind of expect it to do some like half the size of that. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll uh, we'll have a look at that. Can uh, you set these up through your closure code itself? Yeah. So uh, all this stuff I could actually just generate from uh, closure uh, uh -huh. closure script itself. And uh, in fact, there's also a very nice. Uh, if I include specifically include the hiccup library in here as well, like uh, there's uh, there's functions like there's like the HTML5 function, which uh, which will set all that kind of uh, stuff up for you already. So if you do HTML5, see it's a good page. Yes, yeah, so there's like a page. Uh, which I think does help set things up for you as well. Since it's HTML5, so it creates your HTML document with a supplied content. Um, mm. So this is yeah, this is doing all the kind of options and things like that you would include in there as well. So it generates a nice kind of proper HTML5 page for you. Um, and uh, yeah, and there we go. Uh, uh, and then you can have a specific page, and, and you can use these things to help set set up a um, like a nice template. So if, uh, if you uh, yeah, if you're going to have like multiple sections and, and stuff like that, you can set up a template for it to use as well. So you'd have like just one place to to use it. Um, but yeah, I think I've used in the uh, look at the. Um, the status monitor application that I created. So, uh, what is it? Uh, let's go and search for it. Repositories. Yeah. Um, my uh, contributions. Yeah, so, it's, it's, it's <clears throat> so, I think I've used uh, HTML5 for this kind of thing. Let's look. Uh, where am I somewhere? I'm not sure I did do it somewhere. Oh, yeah, so this is a uh, HTML5, and you can put in some extra uh notation in here as well as if you want to, but it's including stuff. And then this is including it's including bootstrap in here as well, and uh, just like kind of the body and the class container and stuff like that. So if, if it's if it's just a developer, a closure developer doing all this stuff, then I think there's an advantage in using. Uh, this kind of style. Um, if if you've got a web developer that is only wanting to deal with uh, HTML, uh, then having a separate HTML file it, it might be more useful. And if they want a, they're going to build like a corporate template and they're using all their uh, like web development tools, then you could just take what they've done and, and put the put the some of the closure script stuff into that. Uh, uh, just like we've done in in this project, uh, so we just basically just include uh, like a, a div or or several divs in to where you want to actually put your uh, closure script content into their template into their HTML. So there's there's yeah so there's chance there's opportunity to work in both ways, uh, and so it just depends on the experience of the development team as to how you want to work really. But yes, yeah, so I, I do quite like doing the. Um, uh, all the code uh, in Clojure itself. Uh, if everybody's happy using Clojure, then I think that's quite a nice approach. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. 
and you can do uh you can do web forms as well i think the form stuff seems to be easier for me as well uh this is just having a kind of drop down uh so i'm using a for uh function to iterate over uh, all the data center locations we've got so we've got a um somewhere I had data center locations. Oh, there we go. So we've got this data center locations, which is just a vector of maps. And so we're just going to iterate over each element in the vector, which is a map of a data center location. And in our form, we, uh, we basically just con construct the form or the values that go into the form just by using this for loop by iterating over all the elements in the data center location, we pull out each location as a map, uh, and then we just pull out the, the values here. Um, I suppose I could have used a get there, but I've just used, I'm just pulling out uh, the option value and name from the location, and um, I'm including that uh, into the form. So I get a drop dropdown uh, of, uh, of all the, so it's a simple way to write a little selector to basically select one of these uh, data centers and that would update the display because uh, we post back um, which uh, which form we're actually using uh, in that in, into that form so we'd select so we'd see the dashboard for a particular data center that we've chosen so i think that's a bit nicer than writing all that in kind of html which is a bit more fiddly uh, i find anyway um cool uh let's switch alt tab uh switch tab uh then yeah so i did those so uh, here i've just added them manually um and so then i started going through well rather than add them individually i'd have to keep on adding new broadcast cards there so we basically want to just put them into put them all into our model um so i think maybe i did that next so let's place g um, oh, I started adding some uh, code towards the end. Uh, so I've added some code here to just help me test and play around with the uh, the app state. So uh, you can you can call the so I, I start the REPL uh, and have the website running. Uh, but I can I can go in and play around with the the content either in the REPL or here I'm just evaluating the code. In the editor, and uh, this will, uh, yeah, this this is an example of how I could reset the um, the title uh, in the app state, and that would just re-render the components, just re-render the um, uh, the jumbotron component, the title of the component, uh, and I can see that working. So I can play around and experiment to see what different titles would look like. Um, I can reset the app state. So back to square one if I want to, but if I make a, a horrible mess of everything, I can just quickly go back and restart to whatever set uh, app state I want to. So here we're just resetting the app state, which are Atom, and I'm just passing back uh, a uh, the whole entire uh, map of, uh, of, of our data structure that we want. So I can put in whatever I wanted here, uh, and that would be the st a starting point. So I can set up different start points. Uh, for helping me test uh, and experiment with the website as well. Uh, and I can get the app state just by uh, using this, this, um, this at sign. So it's at sign also um, rep, uh, is a shortcut for writing the, um, uh, I forgot the word now. Um, ah, I'll come back to that. Uh, Macro. Do you, no, dereference, the de something. Ah. Decon deconstruct. No. <laughs> Destructure, is it? It's, uh, it's for the, yes, yeah, for the deref uh, function. Um, so because this is, uh, because this is an atom, oops. Uh, um, because this is an atom, we've defined our, um, our app state uh, inside an atom. I can't just get the. I can't just treat it like a normal value. We have to. Uh, we have to what we call dereference that value, which just means give give me the value outside of the atom, basically. So just give me the the map. And so you can either write uh, open bracket deref and then app state, or typically you would do um, uh, you would use the shortcut of this uh, at sign. 
and saying, give me the value that app state contains, essentially. So we want to get in. So when we do a get in, we're getting into the, the the value that app state contains, which is a map. So this is get into the map uh, broadcasts. Blah blah blah. So we can go in and traverse uh, that as well. And yeah, and here I just reset it to different values, just as uh, an experiment as well. So you can set these up. I can also write little helper functions. I want to, um, uh, and this is just kind of also the stuff you can also you could include in little tests uh, that you wanted to write as well. Uh, what did I do next? Ah, yes. Um, uh, one little tweak I made uh, to here something when I produce. Oh yes. Um, so when I. Uh, when I did the cards first of all, uh, they were they were kind of nicely organized. Ooh, let's let's put that back to where it was. There we go. They were nicely organized. They had spacing uh, along the uh, horizontal axis, but the vertically that there wasn't a space underneath here. So one of the things I did was just look up in Bootstrap how to how to do that, and um, oops. it was simply just adding this uh, this. Uh, um this border around everything and i also like saw so you can just add a little shadow around the bottom so it makes it look like the cards are you know, slightly uh embossed off the uh, off the off the page itself so they've all got a little kind of um uh shadow around themselves or oh, not actually on here but uh on my there's my local host there we go uh they've all got a little shadow underneath themselves uh, just to make them stand out a little bit more and you can put the various kind of thicknesses of shadow to if you, the, more, the more you want to make them stand out uh, the next one is uh oh yeah and so i've added this broadcast next to uh add the next one but i actually don't think i quite got that as as i wanted it so I've, i haven't actually included it in here yet uh, but I would just basically add another, oops, uh, I would add another, so I'd take this broadcast next card, which is a function, and I would probably put that yeah, uh, between the website title and the, the row of broadcasts. So I'd have uh, like the next one, uh, like as a, just a row in itself uh, above the all the existing broadcasts that are already done. So that's uh, on my to-do list. So yeah, so I'd have something in between the, the all the existing broadcasts and then the like the new one so you can very easily just go to the web page and select the new the new one uh and it makes it easier to find uh the uh, the upcoming broadcast uh next we got here um yeah then i've changed the uh so i've commented out this broadcast card and i uh, Initially, this broadcast uh, function wasn't taking any arguments. I was just basically going in and going from the app state. So it's kind of uh, it wasn't very it wasn't a very pure kind of function in that respect. So um, <clears throat> if other things are updating the broadcast card, then I can't be I can be less certain about what's actually going on. So I'm going to pass the specific broadcast details uh, when I call the broadcast card. And that way, I'm, I'm getting some consistency of what it's doing uh, as well. So it's like well, as it's rendering the HTML for this card, it's not going to be affected by any other functions uh, as I'm doing it as well. So it's, uh, it's a nice kind of way to kind of break down the um, the design of the broadcast card as well. And and all it does mean is that I'm I've got this broadcast details as an argument, and I'm just using that as a local uh, name to be able to get things like the thumbnail and the title and uh, description and so on so rather than doing <coughs> rather than doing this get in app state all the time uh, so i'm not continually going back to the app state um although i could actually i mean i could uh an in-between step is to i could just do a let in here and get the get the app state uh and bind it to a local um name or set of names and then just do that that way uh, but I do quite like to pass an argument so that it's very explicit when you're reading this function as to what it's going to work with, because you can see that in the signature of the function, 
you can see exactly what uh, data it's going to work with and it's not pulling out data from anywhere else it's not um, reliant on information from anywhere else so it's pretty much unique uh, it's very very much self-contained this function uh, and so then I obviously change this bit to um, carousel let's be so here I've added a carousel here which is just basically just managing the rows uh, and I've got um, I'm pulling out the all the broadcasts when I call the carousel so I'm looking at the app state and just give me all the broadcasts as a as a, as a a data structure and then I can go through and iterate through all the broadcasts uh, and wrap them in a so they're all wrapped in a row and then inside the row there's all the broadcasts I'm going through that I've got defined in my map uh, and each what each one of those broadcasts uh, each broadcast is wrapped in this div which is a class of MD3 uh, and we uh, call broadcast cards to render the individual card with a specific broadcast uh, and that way I can iterate through um, the details of each card uh, and uh, I can get um, yeah I can get typic uh, names and titles of these um, uh, rather than just using the uh, uh, where is it? rather than just using uh, the template that I was using because well, all these are the same uh, and the new version is they're all picking up the individual values from uh, the, the overall broadcast map. Go to, um, um, yeah, so I've added, so to the, to the uh, basic app set, I've added all these uh, different uh, broadcasts. So each broadcast is a map uh, and um, with an, uh, an ID and um, URL and so on and so on. So I, added, so I specifically added these into the map as it is. Uh, so again, I'm like hard coding the database in that respect. Uh, what else did I do? Um, oh, yes. And then because the app state was getting bigger and bigger and bigger, I've I kind of moved this app state to a different function, uh, so a different namespace. Um, so I did that. So I've got this closure virtual study group data model, uh, and I'm including that as data model. Uh, and then I'm also including um, like uh, the app state specifically, so I can just use app states if I want to. So it doesn't break any of my existing uh, code because uh, I can just use app state by itself. If there's anything else I want to play around with then. So I can have different models that I want to pull into. So I've taken this uh, app state uh, out of the core um, business logic for this application. And I'm just, um, Somewhere here, where have I, where have I, have I broken it? Oh, and it's in the, oh. Are you, are you looking for App State? Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, it's in the other namespace, isn't it? Yeah, we go. yeah uh, it's, if we go to file, file, uh, then, yeah, so I've got this data model here. So this is our App State here. So this is being pulled in and referred to specifically in there. So when I'm doing, when I'm doing App State down here, it's still going to it's still going to work. Hopefully, so it's still pulling out the the results. There. Where are you pulling uh, data model in? I didn't see that line. Uh, so that's at the very top in the. Oh, uh, requires. Uh, yeah, so it's a required uh, namespace. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So here. Um, so we've got we still got reagents. Uh, so I actually simplified this uh, reagent core as reagents. I pulled in closure virtual study group uh, data model, uh, and I'm giving it a general alias of data model, um, but I'm specifically also including the app state in here as well. So this is like this is like as if app state was written in um, in this namespace, which it was previously. So in order to not break any code, 
then I'm still referring, I'm still including it as if it was there, because I, I, I can simplify this just by deleting this this big bunch of text that's my app state here and get rid of all that. Um, it simplifies the, uh, this namespace and it, we can just see the, the functions it's working on. And if we want to go and look at the, the data model, we can go in and um, change the file and go and look at the, the details of the data model in here as well. And, and it also allows me to play around and, and create different data models in there as well. And uh, I can call them specific and give the data model name specific um, names. So I can do like a def, uh, 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 model. Um, if we, if I was doing some broadcasts with other people, I could, uh, I could come up with another data model. And uh, and then include that into uh, and then use it in here as a, as a data model um, example. Uh, yep. uh, so I can do data model and actually if I can value if I evaluate this. Um, then I should be able to do this straight away as well. Evaluate that one. There we go. Oh, there we go. And then the data model looks be, uh, is it more? Yeah. Trying to do code complete. Yeah. Yeah, it should be up eventually. Uh, sometimes it's a bit slow. Um, so that should work. Oops, there we go. Um, I picked it up. Yes. Um, I think that's just my. The uh, keyboard. Oh, what am I doing? Um, I'm doing it wrong. I'm trying to call it as a yes. yes. So my brain's not working at the moment. Let me just make, switch my brain back on again. Uh, yeah, that's my brain. You could do a print line on it. It would print the contents of it, no? Uh, yeah, I, I can just, it's a value, so I can just, um, I can just uh, exclude it as a, uh, there they go. There it is. Yeah, so that's it. That's it. That's it. I knew there was something I was doing wrong. Uh, yeah, so it's already picked up because I've evaluated it. It's picking up and doing autocomplete for me, uh, and so I can evaluate that because it's just a value. It's just like a, it's just like a value, just like a string is a is a value. Um, and so you can you can evaluate both of these in the same way as well. So if I evaluate the string of two, I get two, and if I uh, oops, I do evaluate that. Um, then I get the empty um, empty map, which is exactly what I've defined um, for here as well. So I can go around and play. So rather than using app state, um, oops, I keep pressing the wrong button there. Rather than using app state, I can use this other alternative models as well and play around with those and experiment to see which models actually work. And um, yeah, that gives me a lot of flexibility, uh, all thanks to the REPL there as well. And that's as far as I have got to the moment. So some of the issues I've got is that uh, uh, these cards are not exactly the same size all the time. So I'd want to try and do something about that. Um, so either kind of cap the the size of the text or um, I'll see if there's a way to kind of manage the CSS so that they're, they're all like fixed sized uh, cards as well. Um, but yeah, it might be quite nice to uh, to do that, and also be able to click on these cards so they would expand into a single card. That's where we get into some more interesting closure script -y side of things as well, because we get closure script to rewrite uh, some of the uh, like styles that we're applying to these things as well. Uh, and that's as far as I have got. So I'm going to leave it there and see if there are any questions. Is there a question? Oh, thank you. No Connie's left, I think. So no yeah. questions for you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Connie. Uh, thank you, Manny. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to keep on working on this. And um, 
we'll either show some more stuff on this together or uh, somebody suggest suggested we also look at um, uh, the because we this is a, it's a very nice kind of way to kind of get into uh, things like reagents and um, there's um, somebody's also suggested we do um, uh, this uh, thing called Expo. Uh, so there's so you can build uh, you can build uh, React uh, applications for Android and iOS using this uh, Expo tool. And obviously this is designed for JavaScript, but there's also um, Clojure scripts. Uh, Expo templates somewhere. Um, hopefully, I can. Oh, there we go. That was cool. Uh, I like Google sometimes. Uh, there's this template um, here, which allows you to do the same thing uh, with Expo. So you can basically write a a React native application using Closure Script, and uh, it will. Yeah. So because it, it's still generating. JavaScript for you with a React Native application, then you can deploy that on your uh, on your mobile device, and you get a, a nice kind of similar same kind of experience as we've done in the website, but on a mobile device. So it, it makes it a lot easier to create uh, and sort of minimize a lot of the complexity of building a mobile app. Um, it's still fairly new. Um, so React Native has been around for a few years. Um, so it's still evolving, but you, if you're building fairly simple uh, applications, mobile applications, I think it's a, it's a good opportunity. And uh, I've, I've done one with, uh, yeah, I have done an Expo project with uh, with JavaScript, and that was very straightforward. So I'll see how easy it is to do this with this project, but it looks pretty pretty straightforward. Um, and uh, you can use like some of the NPM modules as well in your code. You use fonts and uh, font awesome and things like that as well. So it looks fairly well uh, documented. So we'll have a look at this in more detail uh, when I get a chance to have a play around with it as well. Cool. All right. Well, if there aren't any more questions, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and as a recap, if you want to learn more, more about uh, reagents, then there's a really nice guide on here to reagents from Purely Functional TV. Um, learning a bit of Bootstrap is always really good uh, to be able to have a simple way to create good-looking websites. And if you want to do some testing, there's also uh, Lambda Island, which has got some really nice uh, stuff on testing, especially closed script testing as well. Uh, that's another area I'll, I'll try and cover in the uh, in coming weeks and months. All right, thank you very much, and see you next time. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, John. Let's see where uh, stop broadcasting. Whee!